Do you know that feeling when all the pieces in a story suddenly come together in an absolutely brilliant and satisfying way? When you realize that everything to this point has been a setup for an amazing climax. That is the kind of story I will be exploring today. A manga that is brilliant at seeding ideas and a Chekhov's gun in the most literal sense. Right. Okay, maybe I should cut that. Hello, my name is Sean, and I break down what makes great stories tick. So, manga exists in this weird paradoxical space where the medium generally is aiming at long-term storytelling, but at the same time, it actively encourages its creators to not plan ahead far enough to sustain a long-term serialization. Because unlike novels, or movies, or many modern television series, all of which allow its creators to write longer storylines, most manga are released in short, weekly, or monthly installments. Manga series, especially newly serialized ones, are in constant danger of cancellation. And, on the flip side, the shorter installment length of manga also allows authors and editors to more easily adjust the story based on readers' responses. All these factors actively incentivize manga creators to focus much more on short-term story developments rather than the long-term. So, Akira Toriyama, for example, has famously stated that he improvised the story of Dragon Ball on a weekly basis rather than having the major story beats planned out in advance. And the consequences of the manga serialization model also become evident in more plot-heavy series like A Promised Neverland, where the first arc is very tightly woven together, but the storytelling becomes noticeably less intentional after Volume 5. And I don't mean this as a slight against two highly successful manga series, but it is a trend that is caused by the publication model behind most manga. And that is also exactly the reason why I become all the more excited when I come across a manga that excels at highly intentional, long-term storytelling. And that's exactly what blew me away when I first devoured Seven Seeds, a manga by Yumi Tamura. So, Seven Seeds is a science fiction series where most of humanity has been eradicated after the Earth was hit by a meteor. The only survivors are five groups of young adults who are put in cryonic sleep by the Japanese government and revived millennia later. Over the course of the story, they struggle to survive in a harsh, unfamiliar world, but also come into conflict with each other. One of the most remarkable aspects of this series is the way it handles its large casts. Because over the course of the story, we follow over 30 characters, who all forge relationships with each other and experience personal growth. Seven Seeds is also not a story that offers easy solutions. It regularly contrasts two philosophies without providing a clear-cut answer, and at times, even seemingly evil acts are narratively justified. Breaking down all the themes of a rich 36-volume series is too big of a challenge for a single video. So instead, I want to delve into the micro-level storytelling of Seven Seeds and illustrate how intentional and significant even seemingly minor details can become in its overall project. And in particular, I want to trace a single motif, which is the use of guns, over the course of 80 chapters and three major story arcs. What I want to show is that this single issue both encapsulates one of Seven Seeds' major character arcs and that it contributes to the story's overarching thematic messaging. So, guns are most prominently associated with Ango, one of the main characters in Seven Seeds. Ango is part of Team Summer A, which is the last group introduced in the story. And unlike other groups, whose members were selected from the general population and were not aware that they'd be sent to the future, Team Summer A was raised at an institute where they underwent rigorous training in every skill imaginable that they might need to survive the future. This institute let these children compete against each other to be selected as one of the seven that would be eventually sent into the future. The members of Team Summer A are first introduced in a lengthy flashback arc, with Ango as its major focal character. 
In this flashback, we learn under what conditions he and his teammates were raised and selected. At the beginning of this flashback, Ango is among the most talented children at the Institute and being primed as a potential leader for the future team. We're also introduced to Ryo, another prodigy, and Ango's main rival at this point in the story. The two of them are first pitted against each other in a shooting competition. Marksmanship is one of the many skills that these children were taught from a young age to prepare them for any potential scenario in the future. We are shown that Ango and Ryo are evenly skilled at using guns, but Ryo is the one who is eventually hailed the victor of the match. Ango hesitates about aiming at targets that represent living beings, but Ryo is able to shoot at anything without hesitation and even justifies killing humans. Ango's entire outlook changes, however, when he finds out the Institute's dark secret. He learns that the children who were deemed failures are not sent away, as the teachers claim, but they're killed off instead. Ango now becomes terribly worried for his best friend Shigeru, because Shigeru is less physically capable than most other students at the Institute. Ango starts single-mindedly obsessing over ensuring that both he and Shigeru survive and reach the future. His new state of mind is reflected during his actions in shooting practice, because where Ango used to refuse to shoot at human targets, now he no longer hesitates to do so. Shigeru, however, eventually cracks under the pressure that Ango puts on him to excel in his classes, and he addresses Ango's newfound readiness to shoot at people. Shigeru claims that he would never, ever be able to do this. If this were a requirement to reach the future, it would be impossible for him to be selected. In other words, when Shigeru rejects Ango's determination to ensure their survival at any cost, Seven Seeds establishes a conflict between survival and morality. Ango's increased readiness to sacrifice his principles in order to reach the future is illustrated by his willingness to pull the trigger. Whereas Shigeru is reluctant, maybe even unable to forsake his beliefs. Seven Seeds here for the first time poses the question if being selected and reaching a future is really worth paying the price. And it's by no means a coincidence that the series confronts us with this question right before the final exam, where the remaining students find themselves on their own and confronted with a series of disasters and harrowing trials. As the students soon learn, the true purpose of this exam is to weed out candidates until only seven remain. During the exam, Shigeru and Ango have a falling out, and eventually they part ways. And this is the ultimate cause leading to Shigeru's tragic death. In the aftermath of the exam, Ango is haunted by guilt, since he blames himself for his friend's fates. And Ango is by no means the only one who is scarred by the exam. Every single one of the surviving students, which includes Ango, which includes Ryo, is severely traumatized by their experiences and full of resentment towards the teachers who orchestrated this horrifying exam as they are sent into the future. Millennia later, Team Summer A awakes in a pod, and they gather their belongings, which includes a gun for each one of them. But to their shock, they find one more person among their group, one of their former teachers. They unanimously pick up their firearms and shoot him down in retribution for the suffering they had to endure under his auspices. This moment marks the lowest point in the story of Team Summer A, fueled by their hate and their trauma, their willingness to grab weapons and kill without remorse represents the moment they truly surrender their humanity. In Ango's arc specifically, this marks the moment where he has truly become the person that Shigeru refused to be. As we are shown the conditions of Team Summer A after the exam, we get the impression that Shigeru may, in fact, have been right after all. Was the survival really worth 
all the trauma these students incurred to reach this stage. But nevertheless, at the very end of this arc, there's also a minor sliver of hope. As the arc draws to a close, Team Summer A steps out of the darkness that symbolically embraces them and heads into light, hinting that there may yet be a future for them. The story's perspective then shifts to a group comprised of members of Team Spring and Team Autumn. At this point in the story, they've just escaped from a desolated shelter that may have housed a lethal virus. After this adventure, these people all left behind their initial distrust for each other and joined forces. During their travels, they eventually stumble upon Team Summer A. The differences between these two groups is immediately communicated by Team Summer A's outfits. They conceal themselves with cloaks, with hoods, and protective goggles. Their appearance visually broadcasts their status as a squad of elites in contrast to civilians that comprise the other teams. At the same time, their efforts to conceal themselves also symbolize their unwillingness, maybe even their inability to interact and cooperate with outsiders. The first contact between these two groups immediately leads to distrust and outright hostility. Hannah, who's the focal character from Team Spring, shows Ango a diary that they found in a shelter. When Ango first reads about the virus that was present in his shelter, his first reaction is to grab his gun and pull the trigger. He shoots down one of the members of Team Autumn without hesitation. Ango now demonstrates that he has fully subscribed to the justifications he used for killing a human that horrified him as a child. If you remember, back then, Yo suggested that his target may have contracted an infectious disease. Now, Ango is confronted with that very situation, where he encounters people who were potentially infected as well. Ango's actions speak louder than his words. He embraces Ryo's course of action and kills without hesitation. The other members of Team Summer A follow suit, aiming their guns at the first humans they encounter. Hana, on the other side, reacts with complete bewilderment. These are, after all, the first people she has met with a firearm, and she cannot fathom the thought that the last remnants of humanity could commit murder. Team Summer A then decides to retreat, mainly out of fear that they might become infected themselves. Once they regroup, Ango justifies his course of action. You know, after all, in his view, why would they have been taught marksmanship if not to shoot? If you actually have a look back at the scene where the teacher has explained the purpose of teaching all these children how to shoot guns, it becomes clear that Ango has in fact distorted their original intentions. The teacher's aim, pun very much intended, was that the students would use their guns as a means to protect their fellow survivors. Ango, of course, has done the very opposite. These two groups soon come into contact with each other again. But this time, they're forced to cooperate in order to fend off a swarm of carnivorous bats. This at first leads to an uneasy truce, but eventually, Team Summer A, Team Spring, and Team Autumn decide to live together. Most of Team Summer A also begin to befriend the other survivors. Only Ango and Ryo are still actively hostile towards the newcomers, and especially towards Hana. The two de facto leaders of their team are the only ones at this moment who openly carry their pistols around and resort to violence in their interactions with their new allies. There's constant reliance on their firearms as a threat demonstrates that they are unable to form healthy interpersonal relationships. Their trauma has left Ango and Ryo seeking to dominate, not to cooperate. This already tense situation at last spirals completely out of control when the shocking truth emerges. Hana's father, in fact, was one of Team Summer A's teachers. 
This revelation causes Ango to snap. In a desperate attempt to establish dominance over Hana, Ango resorts to sexual violence. He attempts to rape her. But when he is fortunately stopped, Yo in turn concludes that there is only one reasonable solution for these tensions, that is, to murder Hana. His actions fail as well, but Hana is swept away by an underground river in the aftermath and presumed to be dead. These are the events that mark the turning point, the moment where Ango and Ryo have finally completely crossed the line. The confrontation between them and the other survivors gets heated. Aramaki, who's a former baseball star and also the sole remaining member of Team Winter, grabs hold of Ryo. Ango immediately pulls out his gun, but Aramaki knocks it out of Ango's hand with the stone and chastises Ango for not understanding the value of human life. In response, Ango draws his knife. The other members of Team Summer A prevent further escalation, and soon everything that has transpired comes into the open. One by one, the members of Team Spring, of Team Autumn, and even the members of Team Summer A condemn Ango and Ryo's actions, and they state that these two people cannot remain in their community. Ango and Ryo are unanimously sentenced to exile. We soon learn that when Aramaki struck the gun out of Ango's hand, he caused lasting damage that leaves Ango unable to move his right hand. This is a powerfully symbolic moment because it represents Ango's change in fortune. Ango's gun served as a symbol of his violent authority. When Aramaki knocks his gun out of his hand and forces Ango to rely on his knife, we are also meant to understand that the two now stand in the same playing field. Ango can no longer exercise power by relying on his superior weaponry. His authoritarian rule over the survivors makes place for a democratic solution to the conflict. In other words, the moment when Ango becomes unable to wield his gun coincides with his loss of place within his community. At this moment, when Ango is banished from his team, he bears deep scars, both physically and mentally. The story also places him at a crossroads. We're asked to imagine what his path may now be like, since he can no longer rely on his gun to establish dominance. Will he once again resort to violence as soon as he regains the use of his right hand, or can he learn to foster healthier interpersonal relationships in the intermediary time? During their travels in the wilderness, Ango and Ryo eventually come across their polar opposites in the form of Team Summer B. Unlike the meticulously trained prodigies from Team Summer A, Team Summer B is comprised of people who were considered failures in the past. At this point in the story, the members of Team Summer B had acquired a boat that had been preserved for the survivors. After numerous adventures of their own, they have stranded their ship and settled down on a beach with a geyser. At the beginning of this arc, the contrast between these two groups could not have been starker. When the ruthlessly efficient Team Summer A awoke from centuries of slumber, they immediately divided chores and built up a village in record time. Their every move ensured maximum productivity and aimed to bolster their odds in the struggle for survival. Team Summer B, meanwhile, is living in the moment. They're not concerned with any long-term planning. Soon after meeting with uh, Team Summer B, Ango and Ryo notes multiple failings of these people. They've not considered how they will ensure a water supply once a season change. They've completely neglected bone maintenance. And more generally, this nonchalant lifestyle of Team Summer B is a constant source of annoyance for Ango and Ryo. The members of Team Summer B, in turn, are in awe at the newcomer's vast knowledge. But at the same time, they also notice how Ango and Ryo 
are keeping their cards close to their chests. And eventually, the members of Team Summer B also pick up on the boys' unusual proficiency with knives and gunpowder. All this leads Botan, who was sent to the future as Team Summer B's guide, to suspect that Ango and Ryo have not told them the whole story. She sneaks into their cabin on the boat and inspects their belongings. And to her shock, she discovers that the two have actually received guns. At this moment, we get a very important flashback to Botan's briefing before she was sent to the future. At the time, Botan asked her superiors if they would be issued firearms. Her superiors responded there was disagreement among the staff of the Seven Seeds project on this issue. Everyone did acknowledge that guns might be beneficial for things like hunting or warding off predators, but they were at the same time also keenly aware that issuing guns would introduce other kinds of risks. Nevertheless, Botan finds out that certain parties in the Japanese government were actually planning to leave behind weapon storages. After learning all of this, Botan was given the choice. Did she want to bring a gun with her into the future herself? And after carefully considering this, she expresses her reluctance to carry this kind of burden and completely rejects the offer. Botan's decision has been narratively justified by the events of the story. The weapons in the hands of Team Summer B, especially Ango and Ryo, have only led to death and tensions among the survivors. And this message is further reinforced in the following chapters, where we learn how threatening exactly advanced weaponry can become in the hands of the wrong people. Once Ango and Ryo manage to set Team Summer B's boat free, the entire group decides to set out back to sea. They eventually drift towards a ship's graveyard, where a titanic tanker domineers the seascape. They surmise that the tanker might be carrying supplies, and decide to inspect it. As Bota makes her way through the ship, she finds it littered with guns. She quickly concludes that this must be the weapon shelter that she had been informed about in the past. But in contrast to Botan's dismay about this find, the manga also highlights another response, that by Semimaru, who's also a member of Team Summer B. Semimaru reacts with childlike excitement when he discovers the weapons that are stored in a tanker, and secretly takes a gun, as well as a bulletproof vest. Botan also briefly considers picking up a gun, just as a potential counterbalance to Ango and Ryo, but she does quickly dismiss the idea. As the two investigate further, they discover unsettling video footage from the ship's original captain. They find out that the supply of weapons offered a temptation that few on the crew could resist. The crew members had taken hold of the firearms on the ship and began fighting among themselves. The ship's captain himself is the epitome of this weapon-fueled descent into madness. In his final moments, he decides to bomb Japan to oblivion, for what is seemingly no good reason whatsoever. When Botan reaches the end of this recording, she comments that the captain, maniacally cackling as he initiated a launch sequence for a nuclear missile, does not even sound human anymore. But. To her horror, she soon realizes that they made a massive mistake when they entered the tanker. By restoring power to it, they've also inadvertently reactivated the missile launch sequence. They've accidentally triggered a program that will fire a nuclear missile at Japan and eradicate all the survivors on the mainland. These recordings also explain the physical state in which the present-day cast finds a tanker. But, on a thematic level, the downfall of the original crew also serves as a chilling precedent for potential conflict among the survivors. The weapon shelter, a barren bunker of death that threatens to destroy the last remnants of humanity, in many ways parallels the traumatized mental state of Ango and Ryo. They, too, have at this point mainly responded to new experiences with mistrust and violence. 
The previous arc had already established that Angos and Rio's reliance on their guns posed a threat to the newly formed society. Back then, their actions did not cause a larger conflict because the other teams could only carry a knife into a gunfight. But now that Team Summer B has stumbled upon a supply of firearms, they have the option to even the playing field. Semi Mago's fascination with his new toys in particular could potentially be the catalyst for bloodshed among the survivors. They could, as it were, cause a ship's history to repeat itself. While Botan is busy watching the captain's logs, Semimaru ventures further into the tanker's uncanny corridors. But paranoia strikes when he suddenly hears a noise coming his way, and without thinking, he brings his gun out and fires a shot. But his target turns out to have been Ryo, whose sharp instincts immediately lead him to return fire. And once Semimaru realizes what he has done, he is mortified by his actions. He never actually meant to shoot anyone, after all. But by an incredible stroke of fortune, a catastrophe has been averted. The ancient gun that Semimaru picked up got jammed, whereas Ryo's shots hits Semimaru's bulletproof vests. This nearly fatal accident leads Semimaru to properly reflect on the implications of carrying a weapon. He now realizes that guns are tools for killing not cool toys. Semimaru has undergone a moment of growth and kicks the gun far away, out of his life. At the same time, a parallel scene unfolds in a different part of the tanker. Ango, who is currently on his own, starts hallucinating. This is a condition from which he has been suffering ever since the death of Shigeru, his best friend. And in this state, he crosses path with Arashi, another member of Team Summer B. Ango is under the impression that he has stumbled upon his former classmate, who tried to kill him during the exam and played a pivotal role in the events that led to Shigeru's death. During his delusions, he fires his gun at Arashi. In this case, Ango misses because of his wounded hand, the hand that is still not recovered from the damage caused by Aramaki's rock. Ango at this moment forms a sorry contrast to Ryo, where Ryo was able to take quick, decisive action as he was being threatened, Ango is a broken wreck, both physically and mentally. Over the course of the manga, he has lost his friends, he has lost his purpose, he has lost his sense of morality, but also the exceptional marksmanship that distinguished him in the past. Ango's gun is no longer a tool that offers him the semblance of authority. It is now just something used by a traumatized madman. At this point, Ango is in fact close to turning into the delusional former captain of the tanker, leaving destruction in his wake without even truly realizing what he's doing. So, up to this moment in the story, Firearms have been symbols of humanity as its worst. They were tools for Ango and Ryo to dominate and threaten the other survivors. And they drove the crew of the weapon tanker to kill each other. But in the aftermath of these two shooting scenes, something remarkable happens. The moment that these two aloof newcomers bare their fangs for everyone to witness sparks a pivotal change in their relationships. The members of Team Summer B had of course already long noticed that there was something strange about their new companions. They were competent yet oblivious, caring yet threatening. But now, with some of the secrets Ango and Ryo have been keeping out in the open, the process of healing can truly begin. After Ango tries to shoot Arashi, the two fall into a pool of water. They then share a moment together as they warm up under a blanket the first step towards a relationship of mutual respect that the two of them establish during the remainder of the story. And Ryo in turn also slowly warms up to Semimaru and Matsuri, the two with whom he explores the ship. And when Ango is for the second time overcome with his trauma, he finally opens up about his upbringing. He tells about the exam, about the death of his best friend that scars him to this very day. And luckily, with the combined efforts of Arashi and Ryo, he is finally released from his burden, 
from the guilt that he felt because of Shigeru's death. Ango finds release and forgiveness, and in the process, he also regains the use of his injured hands. In his own words, Shigeru has finally healed him. Ango powerfully demonstrates his recovery and growth at the climax of the arc. During the course of this storyline, the human activity on the tanker has also awakened a dangerous species of bacteria. The bacteria has evolved in response to the carnage that took place on the ship, it has developed a taste for iron, including human blood. So in other words, in an environment of violence and bloodshed, symbolized by the guns littered around the tanker, nature itself perpetuates this cycle of destruction and death. Nature's response to human activity is a recurring motif in Seven Seeds, and one that I would like to maybe explore in a future video. So, if you like my analysis and would like to help me share my passion for manga, please yeah, consider subscribing to the channel. Anyways, over the course of the arc, these bacteria ominously follow the trail of our protagonists and start infesting the ship. As the survivors spend more time in the weapons shelter, they notice that the bacteria are also becoming increasingly aggressive. And not only that, they are also specifically pursuing Natsu, one of the central characters of Team Summer B. They soon realize the reason why the bacteria are attracted to Natsu. She's actually on her period right now, and the bacteria are lured by the scent of her blood. This detail was also a crucial plot point earlier in the story, where we are shown a manifestation of Ryo's trauma. During the earlier stages of the sea voyage, Ryo felt the desire to subject Team Summer B to a similar exam as he himself has been forced to endure. At one point, he traps some of the members of Team Summer B in the boat's sauna. But because of our situation, Natsu did not join the others, and she was thereby in the right place at the right time to save them. All this is a great example of Seven Seas' writing style that makes the series feel so intentional and rewarding. First, the manga establishes something that seems like a minor plot convenience. Eight chapters later, however, we are introduced to a bacteria feeding on iron and blood, but we are led to believe that they will not harm human beings. So, when the bacteria start pursuing Natsu, we are given a mystery to solve. We are asked what's the cause of the bacteria's sudden change in behavior. An observant reader might therefore be able to figure out the answer before the story explicitly reveals it, since all the puzzle pieces that are necessary to solve it have already been made available to us. But then, we find out that this is way more, that this is the setup to deliver one of the series' most significant and symbolic moments of character growth. Because as the arc progresses, the, you know, literally, bloodthirsty bacteria become increasingly aggressive and persistent. Their behavior fully embodies the environment of ceaseless violence, as represented by the tanker, and threatens to leave further victims in its wake. At this stage, they no longer target the firearms or bloodshed by infighting that gave rise to them. Instead, they've set their sights on Natsu, who is the most timid and harmless member of the group. They eventually begin to catch up with the group and threaten to consume them. And then, just when all hope seems lost, Ango gives the greatest possible demonstration of his growth and development over the course of the arc. As the survivors climb up a ladder, with the bacteria hot on their heels, Ango tosses his gun down towards bacteria. The bacteria immediately sense an iron object and follow it, which offers everyone an opportunity to escape. As we've seen, Ango's firearm was a constant companion during his darkest days. It represents his willingness to kill others to ensure the survival of his lost ones. It represents his tendency to use threats and force to make others submit to his will. And it represents his blind hatred for his teachers. So when he now casts away his gun, 
It's more than a clever trick to escape. It marks the moment where Ango finally casts away the symbol of his downfall. Ango's act is all the more significant because of location where it takes place. The weapon tanker is in the middle of a ship's graveyard, a place where things gather that have been lost or cast away. This double spread where the weapon shelter is first put on full display is among the most stunning images in the series. We have these realistic boats in the foreground, contrasted against this shadowy, ghost-like tanker dominating the spread, almost as if we're viewing a gateway to the afterlife. The survivors have inadvertently stepped into Pandora's box, a liminal space where violence and hatred live on and threaten to drag anyone who enters down with it. So when Ango leaves behind the part of himself that mirrors the world of the weapon shelter, he is symbolically sealing it away among the specters of the past that still haunt the desolate tanker to this very day. Only now that he has left his own ghost behind can Ango truly venture forth into the brave new world of the future. But even at the end of the arc, Ango's mental state surprisingly parallels the situation on the ship. His step towards atonement coincides with the moment where the destruction in the tanker at last implodes in on itself. While the group has been able to escape by the skin of their teeth, they have failed to stop the launch sequence for the missiles that had been initiated by the tanker's captain at the height of his carnage-induced insanity. But, as they leave the tanker, the power suddenly cuts out. It turns out that as they journeyed through the ship and spread the bacteria around in the process, these bacteria also infested the ship's mechanisms. This has caused the power to go out and thereby abort the missile launch once more. So, just like how Ango could only confront his trauma when he reached the breaking point, in the same way, the spiral of destruction on the ship eventually reaches its natural limit and fizzles out. So, let me sum up how Seven Seeds weaves just one motif into the fabric of its story. At the beginning of Ango's flashback, his change in attitudes towards the use of guns is first used to illustrate how he's warped by desperation to save his friend. Ango's newfound readiness to shoot symbolizes personal developments. But then, the series uses this as the first avenue to articulate the question that surrounds the members of Team Summer A as a whole throughout the story. The question, if their survival was ultimately worth all the pain and suffering they had to endure to reach this point. For the remainder of the story, guns represent a destructive form of survival. Survival that is paradoxically as destructive to their wielder as to their victim. In the distant future of Seven Seeds, guns are constantly used by traumatized, conflicted characters. All this eventually comes to a head in a story arc where the very space warps and is warped by these associations. The weapon tanker represents all the destructive potential of guns that had been established to this point on the largest possible scale. And it's exactly because Seven Seeds laid all this groundwork that Ango's greatest moment of growth is so impactful. The symbolic significance of casting aside his gun is so much stronger than anything that could be expressed in words or images because it feels like Ango's entire story to this point has been built up for this one moment. And that's what I mean about Seven Seeds' writing style being so highly intentional. When you revisit earlier parts of the story, every single moment carries more significance than you initially thought, and it all slots together into a seamless whole. Now, a final word on Ango. Even after he goes through hell and back, after he grows stronger and forges new bonds, the manga also acknowledges that the pain and destruction he caused can never be fully undone. When he eventually reunites 
with members of Team Spring, Team Autumn, and Team Summer A, by the end of the story, he is not forgiven, nor allowed to return to their community. Ango remains forever an outcast, even when Team Summer B joins together with the other survivors. Seven Seeds is a story that is not afraid to leave the final evaluation of one of its main characters in the air, and this is perhaps best reflected by Ango's story arc.